never seen so many refrigeration lines <clears> in one place. And they're not even like done at all neatly. It's just like a rat's nest of this stuff, right? Yeah. And then they went to Roofer to seal it. Yeah, it looks like they just basically took as many lines as they could fit in one fist and jammed it down <laughs> into a hole. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McGone. Today I'm joined by Deputy Editor Matt Milham. What's up? Rob Wadsack, Digital Brand Manager. Hey, guys. And Producer Extraordinaire, Jeff Rose. Howdy. Please email us your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, it is a pleasure to see you guys today. It is always a highlight of my week talking to my interesting coworkers. Likewise. Yeah, we don't get to just peer over the cube walls anymore. <laughs> that, it's perhaps one of the things I m- miss most is nosing, uh, you know, and asking questions about what you all did over the, the weekend and seeing your yeah. respective projects. I should start with you, uh, Matt, because you haven't been on the show in a while, as I recall. Yeah. Uh, How's your uh, mudroom and your uh, gazebo going? Let's see. Gazebo, I did some copper flashing on that. I ordered some. I I decided just to simplify it. I had tried uh, building like a cap for it. I I mean, I successfully built a cap that just looked ridiculous on top of it. (laughs) Did Um, it look like a witch's hat? Uh, a little bit like that. It was like basically, you know, like a, a pentagon that went up to a point, like a, you know, looked like a triangle. So it was, it was faceted. Yeah, it was a okay. faceted thing. Um, so I don't know. It looks fine on the ground, but when I got it on top of there, it just looked way too big and silly to be able to clear the rafters. It was interesting just trying to figure out uh, like the angle cuts and everything like that, you know, because it was five pieces of, it was just CDX plywood. Mm-hmm. And then the frame underneath of that was essentially just uh, two by fours or yeah, two by fours cut on a bevel and trying to figure out what that angle was that they met at for the, you know, for whatever roof slope, it was like just bringing back nightmares of like trying to build this thing from the beginning, (laughs) but I got it figured out. It actually, I was able to do it on the, the CMP on the construction calculator. Like I just screwed around with it. I was like, maybe this works. And the angles were perfect. I was like, I can't believe this happened. Do they have a like reciprocal roof (laughs) uh, shortcut there? Maybe No, no, they didn't. But like somehow the math worked out and I'm sure any roof framer would be like, yeah, you stupid idiot. But for me, it was like, (laughs) guess and check i don't know I, you know <laughs> most people don't get a chance to do that right it's like that's a rare thing yeah so i got a little bit of that done but yeah i'm gonna finish it up probably this week to whatever it's gonna be finished at um then uh let's see what Ben's were you gonna say rob you were gonna, I was ask just gonna say for i was just gonna say for people who haven't listened to earlier episodes if he could give like a five second snapshot of this uh, crazy sc- structure he's talking about Yeah. So it's a, it's a five sided gazebo on a hillside. So, um, it basically has, you know, six footings, one in the center, five around each side is a different length. So it just because of where I could get this because of roots (laughs) where I could get the footings without damaging this tree that I was putting this under the main, one of the main goals was since this was unusable space and impossible to mow because the roots are all pretty much above ground, and uh, it's on a hillside. It was just, it, there was nothing I could do with this. And this seemed like a good solution. It seems like the perfect spot to build a complicated structure. That's right. what I think. So, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> like the the main posts range in height from, I think, like eight feet to about 12 feet. Um, and then it's got a reciprocal roof on top of that, which is... Um, for anybody who doesn't know it, basically it's a self-supporting roof, not like a normal roof. All the rafters overlay each other from beginning to end. So uh, it's what sort I of could like describe a it is like a, a, a plains TP, right? The, the yeah. poles kind of like lap onto each other. Yeah, it would be something like that. So it it's it's a it was a complicated thing to try to get together and to try to get kind of even um, because all the sides are not the same length. So it was almost impossible. It may be possible to center it. I couldn't figure out how to get it to work exactly (laughs) with a five-sided structure. I think I've said before, my advice to anybody would be do not build a, an odd sided structure, like, you know, four walls, six walls, eight walls, fine. 
five walls, seven walls, nine walls, don't do it. <laughs> I mean, some others, anything that's divisible, you know, like nine may not be bad, but five, you know, I mean, it's don't do, don't deal with prime numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and what about the mudroom? That should be probably done, right? Uh, it's not done. I did work on the face frames on that. I built, uh, let's see. Oh, I built a really weird door because I had built this thing so I could get these two garbage cans in, you know, for recycling. And I can't remember what the other one. Oh, I don't know. Two kinds of recycling. Yeah. Um, oh, one is for beer cans, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been so long you only need one it's for yeah <laughs> i've got a big bin out back <laughs> especially now yeah i turned this old big steel tub into <laughs> empty uh storage I, but i have to admit to like kind of covering my with paper when it goes out for recycling because i used to always go back to the <laughs> beer distributor right or the store yeah. as empties right you get a redemption in connecticut and, uh, but now my neighbors see all the beer I drink, so I have to hide it under a pile of newspaper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, when I was building this cabinet, I hadn't taken into account like the that the face frame was going to interfere with the the gar- pulling the garbage cans out. Yes. And I was like, oh, you, as as soon as I <laughs> as soon as I put the garbage can in after I put this cabinet in, if it it's in fine, I'm like, yeah, that's fine. As soon as I put a face frame on it, this thing is screwed. So. Um, you have to notch the face frame for the rim yeah, of the can. Right, which I wasn't about to do. So <laughs> I built a section, basically a door that looks like the face frame. And it's on just, you know, regular cabinet hinges, but it hinges down so that, you know, you can pull the garbage cans out without interfering in it. That's cool. It, it doesn't end up looking that funky. I think once the top's on it, it's going to be fine. So you, you just made a wider door and, 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 and made the face frame mock, you mock to it's, match the others. Right. Yeah. So you won't be able to tell that the hope is that you won't be able to tell that it's really a door. I mean, there is like a, you know, a 16th or maybe an eighth inch gap at the top of it, you know, that <laughs> anybody who really knew what was going on would know what's going on. No one's going to figure yeah. that out, dude. No, you, you're not the first person to have built a, a mock face frame for an, a, an odd scenario like that. I'm sure. So no, uh, I'm sure lots of people have screwed up like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there was that. And then what did I do? Oh yeah. The drip irrigation for my garden. And then yesterday I built a bunch of sawhorses because I was, Oh, I built this um, other enclosure for my regular garbage cans on Saturday and in the process of that, started going through my wood pile to see what else I had out there. And I had, I don't know if they were carpenter ants or what, but they were going at, they had sort of nested inside this wood pile and it was gross. So and when I you say wood pile, you're out. saying like framing lumber, not like cordwood. No, it's mostly, yeah, it's all framing lumber. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of pressure treated stuff and a, a ton of uh, two by six dug fur that I had bought for something that I can't remember now, <laughs> but I had their it's either leftover from a project or something I bought and didn't do. I can't recall, mm. but anyway, so wanted to get that all off the ground. And I had all these extra or old two by fours left over that were bracing from the gazebo. And so I built a bunch of hasty saw horses out of that stuff. Like I it's even so saw ironic. Do you realize I have yeah. like a dozen pairs of saw horses in my shop right now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, these things are great because they take like maybe, 20 minutes at most to build probably like 10 15 minutes to build can you explain it briefly yeah it's basically you just take three four by fours and make like an i-beam out of them and then you take four more or four two, yeah, four, two, two by, by fours, fours. Yeah, yeah four two by fours make an i-beam out of it then four more two by fours that go down his legs and basically the the eye itself creates the angle on both sides. And then the and, top of the leg butts into the bottom the of the, of the in, eye beam. Yeah, so the way yeah. it, it's like all in compression, so nothing's going to come apart or anything. That's a very smart way to make sawhorses, and I would it's say. It's so fast, and it's like it's like the dumb person's way to build a sawhorse, which makes it perfect for me. So Well, and I mean, like, <laughs> how much time and effort do you want to go into making something that you're going to run a saw through dozens of times, and, you know, yeah. it's going to sit out in the rain, like, you know. That's the thing with these. They're just going to – they're basically just elevating this pile of framing lumber <laughs> off of the ground <laughs> so that <laughs> I only I only used three of them for that, and I still had more two-by-fours left over, so I built a, a fourth one. But, um, yeah, the, they'll do the job. And I put a tarp over it, so hopefully they won't rot, rot too fast and the whole thing doesn't come down on my cats, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Rob? 
You sh- well, you put some photographs of some sighting work you've done up on the podcast page. Yeah, I know you guys have been asking me for it seems like months now for what kind of projects, and it's the first we've time we've been asking I've... you to do anything, just yeah. something. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first time. Well, you know what it is? It's the end of the spring planting season, so I can finally get back to remodeling projects. And uh, so, you know, I built my barn on this old stone foundation in my backyard, what, 15 years ago, and I'm finally getting around to putting siding on the backside of it. (laughs) Well, I I put siding on all the sides that people could see, (laughs) and the backside just faces away. So I... Just hadn't made Did it a you priority. have like tattered Tyvek on there? For oh, there was a like uh, tattered bits of all kinds of stuff. There was some. There were some bits and pieces of, of the tar paper, which was the first layer I'd put on there like 15 years ago, and uh, that had to all come off. But uh, no, I, I um, you know, I redid the window flashing as best I could, and uh, I've got these um, recycled aluminum framed sliding glass doors that I put flush with the sheathing so that when I taped the uh, house wrap to it, it, I just, just went right over the aluminum and taped right to the aluminum, so, sort of like a flangeless window installation. And that worked out really well. And then um, the rest of the barn has board, like shiplap board siding on it. Some of it's antique where you can see it the, the best I've salvaged from old barns. Some of it's newer, and none of my local building supply places seemed to carry that like true rough sawn siding anymore. So this is a side, like I said, that nobody sees. So I was fine with doing this uh, texture one eleven, but I realized after I bought it that it's got this outer layer of MDF that's pressed to look like wood grain, mm. and uh, which actually looks nicer than to it to me than the traditional MDF, and it even came with a layer of primer on the outside, which was yeah, keep uh, it painted, man. Yeah, but uh, it's also most of it is going underneath a deck, and then there's a roof over the top of that deck. So uh, most of it's never going to see much weather. But um, it but looks yeah. fantastic. Thanks. But the one thing that because this is so my barn is built on a hillside, and it's got bump outs all over the place, little one story roof sticking out here, and the lower level. I was working basically off of a balcony off the back of the barn. Um, and there's stuff below it that doesn't have siding on it yet. And I, that wasn't as much of a priority to me. I wanted to get this, this balcony looking nice. And it just makes you think about how many times have you come across a remodeling project where you're not ready to go work, you know, to do the whole thing. Like you're not doing siding on a whole building all at once where you can sequence things in, a, in, in the ideal fashion. So then you have to really catch yourself and, and plan ahead because it's like I had to... I had to put some pieces of Z flashing in in some places, and I had to rem- remember to tuck that underneath the texture 111 before I uh, nailed it all off. So the the next layers of siding that are going underneath, and then I finally got smart and I went to the bottom of the the building and at least did all of the house wrap and and tape joints uh, from the bottom up so that I wouldn't have any you know accidental reverse laps later on. So, but it but it's just. Uh, it was fun. I spent like a day and a half this weekend doing it, and uh, it felt felt good. How about you, Jeff? What have you been working on? Did your, ha- your window all painted? Uh, no, I got, did some more painting, but not a whole <laughs> lot. Uh, it's just a lot of, you know, it's, it's all prep, and then it's like, okay, five minutes of painting. It's like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, was, it was, I don't know about you guys, but I found it to be very hot this weekend. Yeah, it was. I uh, did a little carbonary project for my friend Susan. She has uh, had a screen porch on the back of her house. And uh, the word that seems most appropriate is one that Rodney, our uh, art director, uh, came to introduce me to, and it's janky, Mm -hmm. which is just like completely mediocre. (laughs) So somebody had taken this deck, which had a porch roof on it. Both were sound and reasonable, good condition in reasonably good condition. And they took some vertical two by fours and, and an intermediate horizontal two by four, and then put screening over them. And, uh, you know, one side of this, this three season room or porch or screen porch is probably six, seven feet off the ground. So like the screen is not going to prevent anyone from falling. And she acknowledged that, you know, the screens only keep bugs that have already gotten in from getting out unless you do a really good job. So, um, it's not exactly helpful. So I ripped all that out and I was surprised to learn I'd never seen this before 
and uh, and that's considering working on many janky houses in my career. Um, but all this framing they added to put the screens on was done with 15 gauge finish nails. So like some of the boards had lo what looked like 30 nails like securing them to the you know the porch roof <laughs> and the the deck, and then others had like a couple dozen like toenails to like fasten the horizontal members to the vertical ones. I was just like, this is so unbelievably half baked. So I was, it was a very satisfying project to take all that out and then put a sturdy railing up and she can use the space without worrying about people falling off. So that was fun. If you guys familiar with the word janky. I've yeah. heard it used before. Yes. <laughs> I, I can't imagine sitting there and hand nailing 15 nails per joint <laughs> or when I'm framing. Well, so it's from a nail gun, but I oh, mean, okay. you know, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. Still, it was, it was just, and they're, it's so annoying because they're so hard to pull out, right? There's very little head. The nails are very soft. And if you try to grab them with side cutters or, you know, uh, end nippers, they, they just cut off. Right. You have to be very careful trying to pull them without cutting them. What a pain. Um, and I alluded to it earlier, but I've been working on maybe one of the more exciting editorial projects I've had. And this is a complete turnaround. Those of you who are regular listeners of the podcast heard me talking about last week how I was very uninspired for uh, this sawhorse feature that Justin asked me to do. But it fin finally dawned on me that this is a tool test. I could get to buy a dozen pairs of sawhorses and try to wreck them and work on them and see how they <laughs> function. And it's already apparent that there is serious differences in the utility of the sawhorses I've already got. And I think I have six more uh, on the way. So I think it's going to be really cool. And there's going to be some sawhorses shaking out, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so we pay, longer than what I've got. The the uh, Taunton paid for these sawhorses. Like, there's no, uh, you know, people think we have relationships with companies that make tools and stuff, but that's really not the case. I know people that I can ask questions and stuff for, but you know, we paid for all these things. I went to Lowe's website, I went to Home Depot's website, and Amazon, and I bought the five most popular uh, portable sawhorses, folding sawhorses you can buy, and they range in like price from eight bucks for a set of those horrible sheet metal brackets you use with two by fours, right? To uh, some that cost, well, folding ones that cost 50 bucks and then the Trojans, which have always been the like gold standard for pros. These are really heavy duty sawhorses that grip a two by four of any length and they're super tough. Um, those are like 75 bucks a pop. So uh, it's quite the gamut. They have different features. They are different sizes. They fold up differently. It's, it's freaking cool. I'm psyched about it. And you've gotten some good feedback about that, haven't you? I have. So we had a number of podcast listeners, I'd say at least 10, maybe more, um, right, with their thoughts on uh, sawhorses. Uh, we've gotten some uh, homemade designs. I decided to stay away from that for this feature because just to keep it manageable. And uh, as most of the people I talked to early in this conversation said that homemade sawhorses are just too bulky. You know, I need folding sawhorses to fit in my truck or in my garage or whatever. And, and I agree. Um, but to like Matt, if you got some wood around and you need a, a project, gosh, just make them right. It's so easy. Yeah, they're not going anywhere. <laughs> you know? Yeah, they are heavy though. They're heavy and they don't fold up, right? They, they take no. up a lot of room in, tr in a truck. Yeah, it, they'd be a pain in the butt to take apart too. Mm -hmm. So, well, we got some. I'm going to read some of the feedback we got on the uh, sawhorse subject, but not all of it. But thank you all for. Uh, writing in. And uh, if you haven't done so yet and you have some thoughts on the subject, I'd love to hear from you. So we heard from our friend Ian Schwant. Um, he says, after listening to the latest episode of the Roof Assembly podcast, I've been thinking about your lack of enthusiasm for the sawhorse writing assignment. You've likely landed on the idea, on this idea, but here it goes anyway. A sawhorse says a lot about its user in the same way a hammer does. What makes it hard to write about, too personal, too revealing. I've been using my father-in-law's Trojan Work Center for the last few weeks. So that's the sawhorses I described that fold up. But in addition to that, there's a, a, a pair of supports that hold the stock and a table that holds the miter saw. And you just put it on this two-by beam, and uh, it's flexible in terms of how long it is and, and what kind of miter saw you, you can use it with. Um, first siding his house, and now siding my sister-in-law's debacle of an assemblage. 
I dig the Trojan setup. Expensive, yes. It's uh, $210. But the father-in-law has had this setup for 20 plus years, so that has to count for something. Uh, he says, I've also observed the following job site personalities based on sawhorse choices. All right, makes their own from makes their own from on-site scrap, throws out at the end of the job. It says, I am a poor planner, I live in the moment. I am also frugal. I know how many fasteners I've used in every job. What other tradespeople think of me has never crossed my mind. All right, and makes their own from premium materials. Signs, dates, and keeps the sawhorses. I embrace the craft angle of the trade. I went to bed last night thinking about building a sawhorse. I am elitist and think everyone should make their own horses. I fancy myself an artist. I am frugal, but not grew up in the depression frugal. I desperately want to be looked up to by other tradespeople, but I refuse to admit it. <laughs> Buys cheapo plastic sawhorse. Repairs as needed with whatever is at hand. I am probably a painter. I am also a cheap mofo. I glue my boots back together when the sole falls off. I am very patient. Despite my ragged appearance, I do high quality work. Buys mid-range folding metal sawhorses. I have too much going on and too many projects in my head to waste time building a sawhorse. I lack patience. I believe time is money. I usually don't leave enough time at the end of the day to clean up. I prefer to use my own tools rather than my employers. Buys high-end fancy sawhorses. I must be that guy on the job with the best of everything, preferably two of each. I am also the job site know-it-all. I refuse to use any tool that is not my own. I am likely a bastard to work with. <laughs> I buy once, cry once. <laughs> oh, Ian, that's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, this is from David. For what it's worth, I use the plastic slash aluminum adjustable sawhorses quite a bit. They're light and easy to throw in the truck and move around the area I'm working. I also have two sets of Trojan sawhorse legs that I really li like a lot. You need to watch your fingers setting them up and taking them down, but they're just so strong and stable that I find them hard to beat. I've used them throughout the gut and renovation of our house over 12 years ago, and then they sat outside with the same 2 by 6s on them for about 10 years. I would pull them over to my work area when needed, and they never failed. Thanks and love the show. Brings me comfort knowing I'm not the only one who hasn't finished their house yet and that I'm not the only one with weird house problems. <laughs> <laughs> this comes from Rob. This is not about uh, sawhorses for those of you getting tired of that discussion. Mm. Uh, listen to the podcast and the talk of air sealing bypasses in the basement has come up a few times. While this can be a great way to keep moist air out of the attic, it's best to be mindful and remember the house works as a system, so anything you do in one part of the house will have an effect somewhere else. A bypass going from the basement to the attic may be keeping that area, a plumbing chase, for example, warm in the winter with air from the conditioned space. So if you seal it in the basement, you may be blocking the heat source that kept the chase walls and its contents warm and allowing all the cold air from the attic in the winter to fall into the space. So while you may be keeping the warm, moist air off your roof deck in the winter, now you've got cold walls and all these connections, which could lead to a whole new group of problems, including mold, frozen pipes, etc. Uh, Rob, that's a very good thought. Appreciate that. That's, a, that's actually a really good point that I can speak to from experience. I mean, I've got a chase in my kitchen that goes in the corner behind my kitchen cabinets that is open. Air, the air is open to the kitchen. I would love to seal that thing off, but it's in the north corner of my house, all the plumbing running to my laundry room. So it's like, yeah, I think I'll hold <laughs> off on that one. I, I yeah. totally uh, agree with what it's saying. I would also say you need to close the top of that chase off too, right? It's like you, you don't want that air moving in either direction, I would say. And, you know, of course there are subtleties, some things you can't fix, but, you know, I don't think it's ideal to have heat loss and thermal bypasses from your basement to your attic, you know, even if it keeps your pipes from freezing. You guys aren't disagreeing with me? <laughs> no, I mean, I think you'd have enough energy probably going through the wall itself, you know, from the rest of the conditioned space. It doesn't need more conditioned air flowing past it to keep it warm. I don't know. You're saying if the cavity was left open or closed? Yeah. I'm saying if you close it off, as you suggest, you're still going to have enough heat energy moving through that wall, I think, to keep it warm, but maybe not. I don't know. Well, it depends on where it is, I mean, right? I mean, that's yeah. the thing is that the point is, is, is that no matter when you're working in an old house, you have to do a really good survey of all the conditions and what everything affects. Because like, like, uh, the, the corner I'm, I'm talking about in my house hat is open to 
a wall that has no sheathing on the outside. So mm -hmm. there's, you know, equally going to be about more air moving inside there from, if you seal it off from the inside, you're going to have more heat traveling out than, than from inside the house. So I don't know. He, he makes a, a good point, you know? Yeah. Um, you, you do have to look at things from all angles, right? Yeah. So uh, this comes from Philip. So Philip was the contractor who suggested Corey, who wrote to the podcast in episode 257, to write to us. And don't question Philip's judgment. He seems like a very conscientious contractor, despite him advising Corey to listen to what we had to say. <laughs> but he wrote in and saying, uh, I was presently surprised while listening to the latest episode, number 257, to hear that Corey had written in about his house. He seemed so interested in the science of how his house worked. I explained what I could in the time I had during his free estimate and then pointed him toward your podcast. I'm gl glad to hear that he took the advice. Your analysis was spot on. His basement is a concerning source of moisture and would only make things worse if we foam his roof deck. In the spirit of keeping craft alive, I did give him a DIY path to fix his house as well. Foam board and rock wool in the attic and dry lock for moisture in the basement along with gutters and French drains. You mentioned a third-party energy audit, which I'm all for, except the two auditors in this area are the two spray foam contractors he's already <laughs> talked to. <laughs> Thank you so much for being a reliable source of information that I can recommend to homeowners like Corey. That is very nice, Philip. Thank you very much. And Philip is uh, part of Foster Lawrence Enterprises. I forget where Corey was from. I, remember, I think it was upstate New York. Was that the guy with that crazy cut-up roof and had mold problems on the board sheathing and all that you know the people with moldy roof sheathing kind of all run together for me matt I, yeah <laughs> i don't know which set of moldy roof sheathing this was <laughs> yeah uh yeah. so here's here's a question with a definite answer and uh it's not one that any of us would have but i did ask our friend diami to uh weigh in so it's jack jack says hey guys please see attached I saw this a few weeks back and was thinking there has to be a better way. I'm sure disconnecting it and running it back through the pitch pocket is the way to go. But any ideas how to do it without disconnecting? So what Jack sent us a photograph was uh, what looked like at least one or two air conditioning uh, condensers uh, on top of a roof. And the refrigeration lines and electrical cables and it looked like other random stuff are running through the single hole that is a complete mess of tar blobbed around the base of it where it goes through the roof through this flat roof into the building. What do you guys think of that? It's pretty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like garbage. I don't know who, garbage. who did that. I mean, there are flashings they make for those things specifically. Um, so I don't know why whoever did this did that, but it... <laughs> So it's the kind of thing, so I don't know if you guys, when you've been at the Builder Show, have ridden the monorail. And the cool thing about the Las Vegas monorail is, is you get to see down on the roofs of casinos. And there is this wacky stuff uh, all over the place there that you can actually get your eyes on, but it doesn't matter because it never rains, right? And things dry out because there's tons of uh, sun and heat and air conditioning. So it's not a big deal, but uh, there is a right way to do this. And it's called a pitch pocket which is like a little box, goes on the roof membrane, you put the air conditioning lines through it, and then you seal it. And Diami explains the intricacies of doing this the right way. I still don't like the idea of pitch pockets just in general when there are like better flashings. There's also like roof boxes that are kind of like a, like a gooseneck vent that you can run the lines through too, instead of like just basically re relying on what's basically a piece of sheet metal and a bunch of goop. Well, I, you're, of course you're right, I, but I think the reality is in the commercial roofing business, you have to have a way to deal with this, right? Yeah. The sequencing to get that flashing installed correctly with the membrane and the contractor there at the same time is very difficult, I'm sure, to pull off. Right. Well, that's the thing. These other, you know, the correct flashings or, or box you would have to install um, you know, before those line sets go in, because it's not something you're going to retrofit. You're not going to. And it has to be <laughs> yeah. integrated into the membrane too, which means it has to come before that, right? So yeah. that means your refrigeration contractor has got to run the lines before setting the units on the roof. Like it's it's a sequencing difficulty for sure. And I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying, but yeah. Plus, plus um, I figure a gooseneck or some other complex uh, flashing device is probably going to be more expensive than a pitch pot, and that's probably a big big factor too. I'm guessing. Yeah. 
Uh, I would think so. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I mean, you anything, guys know me. I'm yeah. I'm frugal. <laughs> is the euphemism? Um, cheaping out on roof stuff is not where I would choose to save money. No, no. You, you know, it's like that's never a good idea. So Diami Plotke of Roof Services in Deer Park, New York, uh, writes, he's like, the important part about pitch pockets with multiple lines is that sealant needs to be installed between them and needs to be installed directly to the tubing or conduit, not to the insulating foam. To do this, I would carefully remove the existing pitch pockets around the lines, cut off the foam insulation within three inches of the roof, gently pull the lines apart as much as possible to get as much distance between them as possible, if there are gaps where the ceiling could run to the building, caulk them with ChemLink M1, then install a new target patch on the roof, if needed, for the pitch pocket. Finally, install a new pitch pocket with pourable sealer. The pourable sealer should be able to flow between all the conduits in order to properly seal. Okay, he says a better system, though, is when working with mechanical contractors, we explain that each line must run through its own hole in the roof. The lines must be run through without insulation. The holes must be about a quarter inch bigger in diameter than the respective line. There should be one inches of clearance between each line. The line should be arranged in a triangle or square to keep the dimensions of the pitch pocket reasonable. The easiest way is if the mechanical contractor seals them clear with clear silicone caulk first, as a temporary seal until the roofer can seal them permanently. The silicone is easy to remove and then a proper pitch pocket can be constructed around them. The pitch pocket should be consistent with the type of roof. For the smooth APP modified asphalt roof in the photo, I would recommend ChemLink cur Chem Curb, Chem Link Chem Curb, or E-Curb. Both require a patch of granule surface modified asphalt to be installed around the lines first. Woo! That was fantastic. <laughs> All right. I, I don't have anything to add, you guys. Well, the one thing I was wondering is, can you just disconnect those line sets up on the roof and then put one of those, put them through one of these better flashings or roof boxes and then reconnect them? Well, I think it's going to, I mean, it depends on how much money this they want to spend to do this, right? Yeah. So if they have to disconnect the lines, so that refrigeration tech is going to have to recapture the refrigerant. Right. They're going to have to disconnect the electrical electrical components, which might require another tradesperson, right? Yeah. Not all the time can the HVAC guy touch the wiring. So I don't know. I mean, this is this is a pain, and there's yeah. a reason there's this thing has like 12 inches of goop on it. Yeah. Well, right? I imagine they probably have to go up there every six to 12 months and add more goop to stop yet another leak that's developed. <laughs> I wondered and I quit wondering because it doesn't make a lot of sense. But like if you could build a sheet metal box over this disaster that was like what in essence was an umbrella, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're not trying to seal it to the roof, but you're, you are shedding water around it. Mm -hmm. But depending on where this is, you know, roofs, flat roofs are sloped. It could be, you know, a low point in the roof. And almost certainly the HVAC tech put the, you know, uh, line penetrations in the lowest point of the roof because that's just what they would do. <laughs> What do you think, Matt? You're sticking with your conduit? I, I mean, you know, I don't know how I would retrofit it because I've never had to do this. But, you know, my ideal would be, yeah, cut out some of that foam, put one of these boxes that has a, a flange that you can integrate with the membrane and a curb that will keep the water out and have the line sets go through that. And then it's capped and no water is getting down in it. And unless the, you know, I mean, you can get these things probably high enough that it would be above the the parapet, so it would never flood. <laughs> right. No, I don't, I don't think there's any question that is the absolute best way to do it. There's yeah. no doubt about that. What do you think, so, Jeff? What, what would you do? Yeah, I I have to follow Diami. I mean, you call, call Diami, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ask him to fix it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How about you, so Rob? What's your yeah, when I was when I was trying to go online to get a sort of a, vis a visual of what Diami was describing, I saw some uh, diagrams that were cutaway drawings of pitch uh, these pitch pockets that were retrofitted when someone was redoing a roof, and so they basically were building a new, larger one around an existing pitch pocket. So if you could tie that into the roofing membrane you might be able to spread those line sets apart or they might even be far enough apart at a higher point to get exactly what Diami was describing without actually removing the old one below. That's, that's a great suggestion. Um, I, 
it's a pain, right? It's just like, it's a mess. <laughs> I've never seen so many refrigeration lines <clears throat> in one place. And they're not even like done at all neatly. It's just like a rat's nest of this stuff, right? Yeah. And then they went to Roofer to seal it. Yeah, it looks like they just basically took as many lines as they could fit in one fist and jammed it down into a <laughs> hole and did that three times and then just coughed as much goop in there as they needed to. Our next question comes from John. John says, what up, fine air sealing crew? My wife and I are remodeling the kitchen in our mid-century ranch located in Everett, Washington. The kitchen is located on the northwest corner of the building and above a daylight basement. In the winter, the kitchen is one of the draftiest and coldest rooms of the house. I will be replacing the windows and door onto the deck, which have no insulation in the gaps currently, which should improve things somewhat. And after that work is done, I'll insulate the rim joist directly below wherever possible, but it may be difficult as the electrical panel is located on the exterior wall directly below the kitchen. There's a lot of plumbing and electrical work going on through these walls, so I'm hesitant to encapsulate the entire rim in spray foam in case anyone needs to access it. My main question is regarding air sealing the tongue and groove sheathing on the exterior kitchen walls. As we've been remodeling the house, I've been trying to insulate and air seal when possible, but this is the first time we'll be going down to the studs on a large area. What would be the best method to DIY air seal these cavities? Flashing spray foam would be ideal, but I haven't heard good things about those kits. Caulking and taping the seam sounds like a pain in the ass. Oops. Would cut and cobbled rigid foam sealed with canned spray foam around the edges be a reasonable air barrier? I'd like to go in and fill the rest of the 2x4 cavity with whatever fluffy stuff fits to finish it off. The exterior assembly is tar paper over the sheathing with cedar bevel siding if that info is needed. Thanks for the help. The show rocks. Thank you, John. Did you guys look at this house? Did, yeah. Uh, I looked at a couple of the pictures, yeah. <laughs> He's, he says, P.S., the house isn't stealth fighter black. It's a dark navy blue that doesn't photograph well on the iPhone. Last summer after I painted it, a neighbor rolled by and asked me if we got out of the fire okay. He thought the newly <laughs> black house with masking all over it and the windows all over the windows with charred black overspray was the result of a house fire. <laughs> <laughs> that's nice. Oh, that's funny. Uh, I, got so a, he... I, got a, I got a perfect solution for this, and I'm waiting for Matt to shoot it down, but it's called <laughs> Thermoply, and it's cardboard with shiny stuff on it, and it's a good air barrier. And they tell people when they're building new houses – to put these behind those shower units that never gets drywall. So you, you know, it's a, it's a thin air barrier and I will put that right up against the, uh, board sheathing and tape the seams or caulk the, the perimeter, caulk the perimeter or tape the perimeter and then put your uh, fiberglass bats or your, uh, rock wool bats in there and get on with your life. Is that permeable? A permeable membrane or is it? I, so you're going to fight me on these like intricacies <laughs> what, of well, permeability. That's what I, want. I mean, <laughs> He doesn't want to, you know. So I think prevent. it was two perms, Matt. Okay. Uh, so, so it depends. It depends on the flavor of this. It comes in like three or four different thicknesses and, and durabilities, yeah, right? Barrier. Since yeah. he's using it as an air barrier, he only needs the very minimalist thing. But uh, I suspect production builders in certain parts of the country where that don't have wind yeah. use this material as exterior sheathing. Hmm. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, if he has concerns about vapor barrier getting through or vapor getting through that wall, that stuff is basically going to act as like, you know, as a, a, an extreme vapor retarder. So I don't know. Two, it, two perms isn't terrible. It's pretty bad, <laughs> but um, I don't, I don't know. That said, I mean, his, the cut and cobble approach would, you know, be worse. bring it down even, even yeah. more. So, um, I, I, if you could detail it as well as you can do the cut and cobble, which also, you know, would, make a fine air barrier. I don't see any reason why that would be bad. I would say that if you are going to do cut and cobble, make sure you cut your pieces about three quarters of an inch undersize on all sides. So you have three eighths of an inch to foam to. Otherwise the connection is not reliable in the, uh, uh, exploratory demolition I have done. <laughs> so, so you know what I, I was, um, doing a little bit of cut and cobble research before this. And I found a, a forum post on GBA that Martin put out years ago when he was writing one of his articles on the topic. And he basically asked people to tell their cut and cobble stories. And it's actually a great thread. You, yeah. you should guys go check it out. I'll put a link in the, in the show notes, but you had 
the full spectrum of people who said, cut it as tight as you possibly can and get a friction fit because you can't trust that you've caulked every single seam efficiently. And then the caulk is just sort of the belt and suspenders approach. Um, obviously, not in everybody's house is that going to work very well because if you're in an old house with crooked framing, you won't, you might cut it. It fits on the inside, but you won't get it past the front end, lip of the framing. But certainly, or the, the, or the framing cavities are a trapezoid, or you know, it's yeah. it, like anything can be going on. You, you've got to be a really anal person with a tape measure and a razor blade if you want to do that approach anyway. But uh, certainly, the easiest cut and cobble is the way you're describing, where the the gaps you leave are big enough to fit the nozzle without any restriction for the, for the spray foam. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, in in places he he mentions the. Uh, the spray can, I mean, the spray foam kits being a problem. In some places, those things just are the easiest and best solution. But uh, I think they're an environmental disaster. I'm going to just go on the record saying that. Oh, I know you. I know you said you were yeah. going to say that. But but what I'm talking about is like where he's talking about is rim joist. You know, if you've got plumbing and and uh, wiring issues in there, um, sometimes that's the only way. Or maybe you just you just caulk. Uh, the ones that are that have all the stuff in the way, and you kind of cut your losses, and maybe you just don't you, you, in the, you don't hit that rim joist bay. Well, and I was thinking too just now, instead of using the thermoply, I think you could cut, cut and fit you know thirty pound felt and staple it to the sides of the uh, studs and the plates, and have yourself a pretty good air barrier that way too. Um. Yeah, but that, the only thing is like he was talking about like the difficulty of getting a reliable seal with tape. I mean that's. That's not especially on it. asphalt, right? <laughs> yeah. We have to ask the yeah. army what sealant sticks to asphalt <laughs> felt paper, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if he ever has, you know, if he has any thoughts about taking the siding off, although I guess not if you just repainted it, but you know, it would be a lot easier to attack from the outside with, you know, putting up a good WRB that also is a can be detailed to be an air barrier, like I don't know, Soltex Mento or. Henry blue skin or something like that, that, you know, I, you know, I should have, I should have asked John, but you know, I was assuming this is board sheathing, but if, if he has a, pl if he has plywood sheathing, like just use that as the air barrier, just tape the seams, you know, cock around the, you know, between the seam and the studs and the seam and the, and the uh, sheathing and the, and the plates. Yeah. I and, think he, I think he does have board sheathing though. I mean, he could just goop in every one of those gaps. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds that. fun yeah looking at i don't know if you looked at all the pictures he's got i think this is in his basement underneath that kitchen and he's got i don't know 20 or more cables of various sizes <laughs> running through those joists. of course he does <laughs> and I, it looks like a lot of them are uh not meeting the code requirements for the spacing and <laughs> yeah you know distance from the edge of the joists so he may want to get that looked at too before and you know that may make his life a lot easier he might be able to run those a different way to uh make it much easier to insulate that rim it always so I, troubles me to like tell one of our podcast uh <laughs> contributors right to, like yeah. you know your your wiring's a disaster uh <laughs> I know you didn't write in about that and don't, don't lose any sleep, but you know, get that looked at right away. Yeah. It's not even, <laughs> it's not even the wiring itself that I'm, you know, really scrutinizing uh, yeah, at first glance. It's just how close most of those holes are to the edge of the joist. Yeah. Why do electricians do that? No idea. It's as easier to drill. It's just as easy to drill a hole in the bottom of the joist as it is the center. Right. It's like, what's the difference? Yeah. And if you have a right angle drill, like all electricians should, you you don't even need to stand on a ladder to drill those holes. You just reach your arm up. Yeah. Don't get me started. <laughs> <sighs> I had some candy today before the show. That's why I'm all wound up. <laughs> Scott uh, C. writes us, I'd like to build a 14 by 28 foot accessory building wood shop in my suburban backyard on a cheap skates budget. I was thinking of buying a pre-built and delivered on the shed, but with no drive access, I'll be building it myself. For me, it will be a dedicated wood shop, zone five, mini split conditioned, 
and I know I want a wooden floor. I can't justify the cost and complexity of pouring a frost-protected shallow foundation or even a simple pad only to build a wooden floor on top of it. Additionally, my city has no specific foundation requirements under 400 square feet, and there is no homeowners association in my older neighborhood. For resale value, I would put it, I would be nice if it was built well enough for an in-laws unit. It would be nice, it would be built well enough for an in-laws unit, but I will not be putting in plumbing for my use as a wood shop. I'm mulling two options. Stick built skid foundation on a gravel bed. The, this version appeals to me as my lot is has an ideal slope and I'm more experienced in stick framing and shed building. Here's some details. Skids on gravel beds framed in with PT border timbers. I think he's talking about the perimeter, right? I'm thinking of setting a few concrete piers and post ties level with the gravel. Does this add any value to the building's integrity? Would anchoring just the corner suffice or does it need additional supports in the center of the building? What's a reasonable size limit for a skid foundation? Well, I would say that, yeah, you absolutely have to attach the building to the ground, right? You, if, you know, if you have any wind events at all, which is nowhere, or I mean everywhere, um, you have to make sure the structure is not going to blow away or kill somebody, right? Or just make it really heavy. I mean, what he's <laughs> describing is very similar to what uh, Justin and I built uh, for, Rodney for Rodney about six, eight months ago, something like Can that. Can I ask how you get one of those... Uh, Justin and Matt Milham built sheds any, <laughs> anyway. You, 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 you're our art director. That's how it happens. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so. I mean, my, my shed in my backyard's 10 by 20 and it's just basically uh four by four skids sitting on gravel. And, uh, I don't think there's anything holding that thing to the ground. So. Yeah. But what if you live in Iowa or Nebraska or, you know, yeah, I mean, Colorado or, Florida. Yeah, it may be risky, but I mean, you know, around here, uh, you know, where I live, there are tons and tons of old barns that are probably from the 1800s, maybe early 1900s. And a lot of them are just on stacked stone foundations and they're not attached to anything, you know, and they haven't, they're still there that, you know, the rock yeah. hasn't fallen over, the barns haven't blown over. And I'm in what's, you know, what the code calls a special wind zone where our, you know, in order to get a house built now you have to have like a basically an assessment done or someone someone nearby but do you think that's a one. fair comparison so i'm gonna i'm no, gonna ask. there's something like if you're in like a place that has tornadoes and stuff like that all the time probably not but i mean we've had quite a few tornadoes and i would point here. out too that most <laughs> old barns that are the, the way you describe them have yeah. holes in their sheathing so you know some of the wind can get in and out right mm -hmm. um, they're also freaking heavy you know, they might have a slate roof and they might have an oak timber frame. They're, they're almost certainly a board sheathing, but this yeah. is going to be a, a little structure, you know, but it is also going to have table saws in it. So, yeah. you know, that's the thing. I mean, it, it, is it uh, ideal? Probably not. <laughs> but I mean, it's, you know, if it's something that's outside of code, um, you know, because it is a pretty small building, it, you know, I don't know exactly what actual requirements there would be there's a difference between best practices and what you have to do <laughs> right and i can tell you that mobile homes are connected to the ground so they don't blow away with i think they're called earth anchors which are like you know there's a couple things like one is a plate that you drive into the ground and then when you pull back on it, it it's called a tipping plate the thing turns perpendicular to the way you put it in the soil hmm. and then there are these kind of corkscrew things that you know and all these are then strapped to the structure to keep it from pulling lifting up yeah. and it, it seems like that's a pretty simple thing to do at a minimum. But I mean, what he's talking about essentially is, you know, shed sized. And I mean, there's probably 10 million of those at least around the U S that are, you know, <laughs> built similarly. <laughs> In the podcast uh, notes, I'm going to write Matt Milham says, don't worry about <laughs> uplift. <laughs> I, I won't say don't worry about uplift, but you know, all right, you guys got to get to his, his meteor. Meteor points yeah, there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, he says two by six, two by eight floor, 12 inches on center with quality subfloor and probably a wear layer of masonite for the finished interior. Not sure how to insulate and seal the floor. Well, you need an air barrier on both sides. Matt, you did that uh, article on uh, doing that, right? That's a good piece to start. We'll put that on the podcast page. Have you ever seen a wear layer of masonite? That sounds a little slippery to me. Uh, that's know. the first thing I thought too, is that sounds like an extremely dangerous situation once you get some sawdust on that. But yeah, yeah I, that's I, probably I might, true. I do I know that like 
good remodelers use that as floor protection though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you just want to, you it's still pretty, it can be pretty slippery stuff. So I, I don't know if, if you've got sawdust on the floor, I think I would, I would go with something a little bit rougher or if, if it's, if you get the kind of masonite that has like a bumpy side and a smooth side, put the bumpy side up. Yeah. He says they'll have uh, two by six walls with LP smart panel siding. Remember, I'm cheap, and this is just a wood shop. Plus, it will match the shed right next to it. Upgraded siding can be a problem for future me. Mm. Present me doesn't have the time or budget for better options. Uh, he says, air seal the back of the LP with, and then install unfaced bats, and then maybe continuous envelope of one-inch rigid foam on, in the interior. Or would that cause moisture issues? Do I need plywood spacer stitched in for finished wall material, material mounting? I would say that... Uh, you know, make a drywall air barrier or some other good air barrier and then put plywood on top of it. And that's way you can hang up all your stuff. And the risk with just putting up plywood and not the drywall is it's unless you seal the seams with care, it's not a very good air barrier. The, well, the other thing is he doesn't talk about sheathing this thing at all. And then he's really going to have No, he's saying smart panel. Uh -huh. So it, it's the like T111 type oh, smart okay. side okay. stuff. It's sheets. Yeah. Yeah, do that. And he says, should I do that or a post frame? I've tried. So he's, he's asking, do I build a stick frame building or do I build a post frame building? I've tried to stop it up on this, but it's foreign to me, especially how to implement a wood floor without pouring a slab. How would you go about finishing the interior for my purposes? So read my yeah. blog about my barn. I, I did a concrete floor. I don't know how you could do a wood floor unless you pour concrete first. So I would say build the wood frame building. If I had to do this building again, probably do that. <laughs> Couldn't you just put down like tamped gravel and then a bunch of sleepers and then flooring on top, some, some kind of wood floor on top of that or no? I don't like it, man. Do you? I don't love it. I don't but like anything shed, in contact with the gravel. For a shed? I mean, PT sleepers and then, you know, either PT decking or something like that for a floor. If it was just a wood shop, but what makes me think that this is going to be more than that, when he says he, when it comes time to sell the house, he's going to make it nice enough that it could be an in-law suite. So, I mean, that tells me you absolutely have to do a better but job. Then at that point, though, do you need to get plan review and all that stuff to get a CL, you know, for that? And oh, I'm sure. So then you have to build a code to begin with, and, you know, you can't do that retroactively. Yeah, I mean, based on his experience and his needs right now, a skid shed on gravel stick frames just seems like a no brainer. A no -brainer. Yeah. yeah. I think we all agree. What do you yeah. say, Jeff? Sounds good to me. <laughs> Perfect. That never happens. Uh, all right. This is our, apparently our workshop building episode. This comes from <laughs> Wade. Wade says, hello, FHB podcasters, big fan and longtime listener. I'm looking at adding a 30 by 50 Two story shop to my existing 24 <laughs> by 24 foot garage. That's, Wade is an enthusiast, I can tell. That, I love that, it. That's my kind of shop. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I had room for that. Oh, it's fantastic. My main concern is the finished product looking weird due to the height. I'd like the main shop area to have 10 foot ceilings and the second story finished to about eight. Assuming a 412 pitch, that puts my peak height at a minimum of 25 feet. If I do a step down from the existing garage of approximately two feet, which I can, can do, which I believe I can do due to the ground slope, that would still put my shop peak about four feet above my house peak. Is this a big no-no? Would love your keen insight on this. That is totally not a problem. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you see these, these, uh, a lot of contractors have these kinds of things tacked onto the side of their houses where you see like a normal size garage and then a big behemoth garage. And it's certainly in many cases will dwarf the house, but you could probably solve that with some, you know, carefully placed, you know, uh, aesthetic details on the front. Cause he's even talking about turning this thing perpendicular to the house so that he's got a gable end right facing he has a little pencil sketch yeah. right yeah so yeah. basically he's got a house that's what is it like a cape or something like that and then a, his roof of his garage is a little bit lower than the house roof and they both face the street and then he's turning this thing 90 degrees to it which obviously is going to make it very visible from the road so i don't know i might i might maybe set 
the gable back a little bit and do a little sloped roof over the garage doors to sort of tie break in the up line. that element that, to you break know, that up huge the line. face. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it looks like he's got a big shade tree in front of it too, which might block some of the view from the street and maybe he just plans to, to do buy some big shrubs or something like that. If you want to kind of like soften the look of that side of your yard. But I, I think a couple of like carefully placed horizontal trim or roof details on the front of that uh, shop will help uh, help him a lot. So the first time I went to Vermont to mi- visit my then girlfriend at her home, I saw all these very unique homesteads with a house, which was either usually a colonial or a cape, a connecting structure, and a barn. And everywhere else in the world, uh, you don't want those structures connected because if you lose one in a fire, you lose them all. But in Vermont and northern New England generally, it's so cold that you don't want to go outside or you can't to feed the cows. So, you know, all these buildings are connected. And I think that's the kind of what he's got here. And you could make it look really cool if you, you know, riffed off that vernacular architecture, I would say. Mm-hmm. I would certainly, uh, with an attached barn like that, if it's a workshop, think about doing a, a double layer of drywall fire safe details between the garage and the house or behind between the garage and the shop. You know, like you were saying, you don't want like that's one of the main reasons why I would never want my metal shop attached to my house, because if it goes. Yeah. And it does matter what he's making in there. Right. I would worry less about wood. But if he's got a metal shop, yeah, you definitely don't want a fire to spread to your house. Yeah. But yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. The classic New England attached farmstead, I think, is if you detail it nice. I mean, any building, if you detail it right, can can look attractive. It does the scale. I'm not worried about. Yeah. Anyone else have anything to say about this? Well, I was wondering the garage doors that he's planning for this, are they going to be like so that he can drive all the way through the building and come out the back? Or is that just going to be the entrance? You know, there's just on one side. Um, would it be possible to move those doors to the back and do something different on the front so that, you know, you can maybe make that look more like a barn and less like a garage? Mm-hmm. Um, I, that might make it, you know, blend with the house a little better. But, or even do like barn style garage doors on the front. Right. Yeah. And that was that was the other thing I was thinking. But I think it's great too. Like we don't know what kind of siding he has on his existing home and driveway or garage. But uh, you know, I would I would do something different, right? To to make it look more like it is, you know, evolved over time. Like I love vertical board siding on barn shapes, right? It just it mm-hmm. looks appropriate. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe maybe even we should try to track down some pictures of those classic northern New England uh, farmsteads. And, and for do you guys know what I'm talking about? Isn't that a yeah. cool look? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have you yeah. seen that anywhere outside of nor- northern New England? No. I, if if we have any listeners who are in the colder parts of the Midwest, uh, let us know if you see that kind of architecture. It would seem like you would, given the. Yeah. yeah, I mean, what, what fit- kind of how do you describe winter in Minnesota? <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> I mean you, figure, <laughs> you figure it's not even necessarily just for temperature. It's like you don't want to have to shovel seven feet of snow to go to the barn, you know? Right, right. Yeah. And I love that he turned his gable the right way, you know, so it doesn't shed in front of the doors. That is something in snowy. Pl- I don't we don't even where is this? In snowy places, you know, off if you make the eaves dump in front of the front door or the garage, like that's just a dumb thing to do. Yeah, and people, My, people don't worry about it if you don't get, you know, you start to worry about when you you measure your, you know, winter snowfall beyond a hundred inches. Yeah, my parents, they live in the Adirondacks, and they bought their house in August, and I think realized, you know, by the <laughs> <laughs> this is the first the first winter that uh, the orientation of their uh, garage roof was problematic because, yeah, it does slope and it dumps all that snow right on the driveway so they can't get out. So, you know, first and thing And it's hard to snow, plow, you know what yeah, I mean? You have yeah. to kind of back drag it. And if, if it gets frozen into a lump, then you got to like break it up with a mattock or whatever. Yeah. Well, they've got a, you know, a, like a tracked snowblower and, you know, he goes out with the roof rake and rakes the stuff off the roof before, you know, it falls and freezes or whatever, you know, so that he can then snow blow it all off to the side along with everything else. What so <laughs> What a pain. Yep. Well, we only got time for one more thing, but I wanted to share with you all 
that the FHB podcast stickers are out of COVID lockdown. So those of you folks who haven't gotten your sticker, you've written, written in with a question or comment, please send me an email with your mailing address. I will get those out to you as soon as possible. And I'm sorry for the delay. And if you have bought a fine home building t-shirt for a limited time only, I will also send you a podcast sticker if you send me a photograph of you wearing the t-shirt. Sounds good. Guys, have anything to add? Nope. Did uh-huh. I give you all podcast stickers? I've got, I think I've got two on the back of the computer, which I can't show anybody because it's on the back of the computer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you can get two mirrors. Yeah. <laughs> so what's on your library there, Milham? What do I got here? Uh, I got uh, John Carroll's Working Alone. I've got Will Holiday's A Roof Cutter Secrets. We got Audell's. Are those all fine home buildings you've worked on? No, this is all stuff that I've bought over the years. Actually, the, my dad gave me working alone when I was in school. So no, no, um, the, oh. I, those are fine home building magazines behind you too, right? A oh. stack of them. Are those uh, all ones you've worked on? Uh, yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, I think so. Just about. I used to save mine too. I haven't done that for ten years. Yeah, <laughs> There's also a bunch of fine woodworking up there though. So. Yeah. I save those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been nice hanging out with you guys today. Yeah, man. It was good to see you, you guys. Uh, well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank to Matt, Rob, and Jeff for joining me. And I want to thank all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Thank you again for listening. Stay safe and happy building. <laughs>